Hello, I'm Pastor Brian from Charlestown Baptist Church. We invite you to come and join us as the church gathers for worship. But until then, we put our sermons on video so that we can be a ministry to you and your family wherever you are. God bless you. You may have noticed the bushel basket. We'll come to that in just a few minutes. We know that a mile has 1,760 yards, right? 6, 5,280 feet. We know that a yard has three feet. One foot has 12 inches. What defines an inch? About like that? Something around maybe the size of a quarter? Well, an inch is 25.4 millimeters. What makes a millimeter? 0 0.0393 of an inch. A pound is 16 ounces. An ounce is a sixteenth of a pound. A kilogram is a thousand grams. 2.2 pounds. A gram is one thousandth of a kilogram. A gram is 0 0.035274 of an ounce. And if you keep going, all those arguments become circular. Because the inches are defined by millimeters, the millimeters are defined by inches. Way back when Noah built the ark, he, the, the Lord told him, build it 300 cubits long and 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits tall. And because of scholarship, we know that a cubit is the distance from your elbow to your fingertips, right? About 18 inches, give or take. Because my cubit is about 19 and three quarters of an inch. And someone of shorter stature, your cubit might be, Judiot, you might be about 16 inches or so. <laughs> or maybe less, I don't know. Because of those variances, there is an office in Gaithersburg, Maryland, that houses the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is part of the Department of Commerce, and they regulate and define our miles and kilometers, pounds, gallons, tablespoons, inches, feet, all those things. And all of that is in scientific, precise detail so that there is a standard. So when you say that your car gets 27 miles on a gallon of gasoline, we know what a mile is. And we know what a gallon is. So we can agree with that. Now all those things are physical objects that can be quantified and measured, hard and fast things. And that's important. Infinitely more important, love, grace, peace, hope, and understanding. And how do we measure and define those sort of things? How do we measure love? What color is it? How much does it weigh? How much mercy fits in a gallon jug? Is there any way to define that? How much grace fits in our soul? The more important things of the world, the intangibles, they're somewhat ethereal, somewhat untouchable. The matters of the spirit, and they're much more like cubits than they are feet and inches. Because your understanding of love and grace and peace will vary a little bit from mine. And how we apply those traits of character will be different among us. We have odometers to measure the miles. We have rulers to measure the inches. We have scales and, and measuring cups to weigh out our ingredients for the recipe. And we have this word of God that helps us to understand and apply the more important characteristics of life. Love, peace, grace, kindness, and hope. And there is a guiding principle that we're going to look at today. And that is that with the measure you use, it shall be measured back to you. If you choose to be stingy with your love, if you choose to be generous with your criticism... Well, in the same way that you distribute those qualities, assuredly, 
they will come back to you in the same way. We're going to be in Luke chapter 6. The full and more well-known version of the Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But Luke recorded portions of that great uh, message. And in Luke 6, 36 to 38, we have our focal text a little bit more condensed than Matthew's version. And I invite you to stand that we would honor the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 36. Therefore be merciful, just as your father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you'll not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it'll be measured back to you. Almighty God, enlighten us today. Help us to see the necessity of a big bushel basket to share love and mercy and hope, and that you, Lord, would be honored and glorified in it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. A bushel basket. Actually, I think this is a half bushel, but it's what we had, so you get the picture, right? I wasn't going to go try hunting all over town to find a proper. By standard weights and measures, there are eight quarts in a peck. Four pecks make up a bushel. A bushel is 2,150.4 cubic inches. 35.24 liters. And when you go to the farmer's market and buy a bushel of apples, that is going to weigh about 48 pounds. More important than an apple, how much mercy do you carry in your bushel basket? Verse 36 tells us that the standard for mercy, to be merciful, is the very same as that of our Father in heaven. And how much mercy does he have? Quite a lot. Certainly Jesus was big on mercy. In contrast to the religious experts, the Pharisees, they were stuck on the letter of the law. Jesus understood the spirit of the law and the intent of the law. Yes, God is just, but also God is merciful and full of grace. Mercy is undeserved. Mercy is not something that we are entitled to. Two. Mercy is at the discretion of the giver. Mercy withholds the just punishment and instead gives a blessing rather than a curse. Years ago, there was a fellow named Fiorello LaGuardia, and he was the mayor of New York City during the worst years of the Great Depression and into World War II. They named an airport after him. One night in January of 1935, the mayor showed up at night court that served one of the poorer districts of the city. And because it was a city court and because the mayor was an attorney also, he dismissed the judge and took the bench himself for that evening. One of the cases that was brought before him was an elderly woman who was accused of stealing a loaf of bread. She admitted to the theft explaining that her husband had left, her daughter was sick, and her grandchildren had nothing to eat, so she stole the bread. The shopkeeper from whom the bread was stolen was adamant. He said, Mayor, it's a bad neighborhood. If we let this one off, all the rest of the riffraff will come and steal all my goods, and I'll go broke. The mayor said... I do have to find you guilty, and I have to punish you, and the law makes no exceptions for that. And the fine is $10 or 10 days in jail. And even as he was speaking, he was reaching into his own pocket, and he took out a $10 bill and gave it to the clerk and said, I am paying the fine on behalf of this woman. Furthermore, 
I am fining everybody in this courtroom for living in a city where an old lady has to steal bread for her grandchildren to eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines from everybody present. 50 cents apiece. The bailiff did so. And they gave the lady $47 worth of quarters and said, go home and be blessed. 50 cents of that $47 came from the shopkeeper that wanted to charge her with a crime over a loaf of bread. That's mercy. Undeserved. Unearned, but given anyway. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will find mercy. James tells us that judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy always triumphs over judgment. And if we are a people who live without mercy, how can we expect God's mercy to be at work in our lives? In fact, Jesus told us quite clearly, Matthew 6, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you fail to forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now to be clear, I don't think we should read into that verse as a condition of our salvation that we earn God's forgiveness by being a forgiving people. But I do believe that when we practice a hardness of our heart, when we are stingy with our mercy, that we will fail to embrace or experience the full power of God's mercy in us and will not live in the transformative power of God's grace and we will hinder our own faith and our lives before him. Amen? If we are an unmerciful kind of folks, if we're a hard-hearted kind of people, that in itself is a form of judgment and condemnation on the others. And we make ourselves to be the arbitrator of right and wrong. Take a look at verse 37. Judge not, and you'll not be judged. Condemn not, you'll not be condemned. Weekly... We put our sermon and some worship music on social media, mostly Facebook and YouTube. And that seems to have some benefit because we can reach a little bit further. Those who are not yet comfortable being out in public can be connected to our church body. And it costs us next to nothing to do that. So we're going to keep on doing. And you know, I really like the idea of getting the message of grace out beyond these four walls to where people are. Amen? That's important. And that's a good thing. But you probably notice also that, for me anyway, I do very, very little social media beyond that. And that's because so much of it becomes contentious and argumentative, and downright ugly and mean-spirited. And any time you make a public statement in favor of something or opposed to something, anything, you're going to offend somebody, somebody's going to disagree, and social media seems to have become the platform which anybody can weigh in and say anything they want, open season to criticize and counter-accuse and launch condemnation against the other guy. It seems we're willing to say all kind of things through electronic means that we would never say face to face to face. I don't know why that is. Jesus says, judge not, you'll not be judged. Condemn not, and you'll not be condemned. Now, clearly, and you know, and without question, there are certain actions and attitudes and behaviors and ideologies that I cannot and will not agree with in the world. There are certain things I just cannot condone or approve of. And I honestly believe that most of my values and ideas about those sort of things are formed and shaped by this word of God and what God has clearly stated. And I hope you feel the same, and I hope your life and your values are shaped by what God has said. Amen. However, 
There's no need, there's no just cause to go pointing the finger of accusation simply because people disagree with what you say or what you think, or even what the Bible says. Because all those ideologies and actions and behaviors, even though you disapprove, they are connected to people. And people are what matters in God's sight. And if our conversations begin with the statement of, you're wrong, and I'm right, and God has said, <laughs> how are you going to build a relationship after that when you pass judgment when our approach is based on who can win an argument all we do is open ourselves to more criticism and con con uh, condemnation as well I don't have the emotional energy to argue with everybody I meet and I don't see a need for it I have yet to see how guilt fear or shame are productive in light of the gospel. However, I do believe that the way of Jesus is the way of grace, mercy, and love, and acceptance. When your bushel basket is full of venom for the other guy and you just pour it out constantly and continually, you live with that that critical spirit or harsh words about anybody who does anything wrong, do not be surprised when you get a double dose of venom back at you. Because that's how it works. Verse 46, out of, the, out of the good man, I'm sorry, verse 45, a good man out of a good heart brings forth good things. Evil people out of the evil heart bring forth evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks in other words what comes up in the bucket is what's down in the well and if you've got a life full of criticism and condemnation and judgment for everybody that crosses your path well maybe maybe it's time to take a good hard look in the soul amen Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 tells us that sowing and reaping are a biblical principle what you give is going to be what you get. God is not going to be mocked. With the same measure that you use, it shall be measured back to you. A man and a woman were on a road trip, husband and wife. They stopped for dinner. They had their meal. It was fine, and they got back on the road. They'd gone about 20 miles past the restaurant, and the lady said, Oh, my goodness, Henry, turn around. I left my purse at the restaurant. Well, Henry was none too pleased about any of that. And he said, how could you? Now we're going to be late. And now we've got to go all the way back. Somebody's going to go through your purse and steal all your money, Harriet. I cannot believe you would be so foolish, Harriet. And you're always forgetting something everywhere we go. So it went on like that the whole 20 miles back to the restaurant. And he pulled up in front, and she got out of the car, and as she was going into the restaurant, he said to her, Hey, while you're in there, pick up my hat. <laughs> a couple of verses after this, we have Jesus telling that story about the speck in your eye and the plank in my eye. In John... We have a crowd gathered around to accuse a woman who was caught in a moral failure. And Jesus said, he that is without sin, let him be the one to cast the first stone. And we take all those verses and these stories kind of together. I think it tells us first, clean up your own front porch before you worry about the neighbor's yard. Clean up your own house before we worry about, you know, Everybody else's problem. When you get all your issues, all your issues straightened out, then maybe we can talk. And secondly, it is crystal clear to me that love and grace and forgiveness are more powerful, more productive, and more aligned with God's values than judgment and condemnation and claiming some sort of false moral superiority. 
Verse 38 tells us that give, and it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And this verse always makes me think of brown sugar. Brown sugar, you know? You scoop out some brown sugar for your cookie recipe, and you shake it down, and then you press it in, and then you scoop out some more and press that in, and that's why your grandma's cookies tasted so good, because it was pressed down, super sweet. For all my days in church, for as many times as I've heard this verse preached on or talked about, it was always applied in the sense of our financial stewardship. And as we give, it's given back to us. And I think that fits. And I find it to be absolutely true. And you and I all know the principle of the tithe, giving the first fruits of all our increase to the Lord, honoring God with our finance faithfully living with generosity toward the kingdom. And as we do that, God always shows himself to be faithful and true. And in this church, so many of you practice that faithfully to support the work of the church for the, for the sake of the kingdom of God. I'm very grateful for that. And as you probably already know, to do good ministry, it does get expensive. So I'm grateful that we are giving church. And as we give... God has a way of always giving more. And when we obey God with that and we trust God and in faith, uh, the 90% that we keep for ourselves is always more than enough. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And if we try to live stingy with our finance, we try to cheat God or give God the leftovers, it never seems to be enough. So the tithe is... It works, trust God, and honor him. Amen? But as I was reading this passage again this week, preparing for today, in context, there is nothing around here for several chapters about finance or the tithe. The instruction in context is about our relationships to one another, to give love, to give mercy, living with an abundance of hope, an abundance of faith, loving even our enemies when they seek to do us harm, doing good even to those who are opposed to us. Give of yourself, and it shall be given back to you. Give with joy. Give love. Give grace. Give peace, give kindness, give encouragement, and all the best and most important things of the world. And as we live and give of ourselves, the blessings come back to us. And likewise, if we live and give with a hardness of heart, if we, if we give a critical spirit, if we give judgment and condemnation, then the promise still holds up. And if we give those things away in abundance, then that is what will be returned to us. Because sowing and reaping are a biblical principle, and God will not be mocked. How big is your bushel of grace? How much mercy can you show even when it's difficult? What is the standard of measurement that you use when you interact with the people and the world around you? If you give just a little bit of love, you get a little bit of love back. If you give this half a pint, well, half a pint is what you may well receive. But if you pour it all out from a big bushel, your life will be filled with love in return. Because with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus is always the master teacher. And sometimes he was incredibly funny, like with the speck in your eye and the plank in my eye. And sometimes he was mysterious and kind of confusing like with the parables and the disciples would would say 
can you explain that to me a little more? And sometimes he was bold and direct and straightforward, like in verse 46 of this chapter, when he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet not do the things that I say? Why do we call him Lord, Lord? Why do we claim to be followers of Jesus? Why do we say we love the, fa the Father with our heart and mind and soul and strength? And yet when it actually comes to the way of living and the doing of the things that he calls us to do, we find that to be so hard. When it comes down to denying the self and taking up the cross, when it comes down to letting go of pride and self, when it comes down to embracing humility and living a transformed life and being doers of the word and not hearers only, that sometimes to be, seems to be much more challenging. Our faith is more than words. Our faith is more than good ideas written a book, in a book. Our faith is more than knowing the things that should be. Rather, let it be the pattern for the reality of our lives. And let us be found faithful in living out the gospel day by day by day. And maybe we can sum it up in terms of our present day reality and the interactions that we have with verse 31 in this chapter. And just as you would want people to do for you, you do to them likewise. And we take that golden rule and apply it in every interaction, every circumstance, every relationship, and we, we start it up by treating others the way I would want to have been treated. And I think love and grace and mercy and hope are in short supply in the world today. And somebody's got to start it. Somebody's got to initiate it. And God says, that ought to be you. That ought to be my people. To in be initiators of love and grace and hope. And let us be found faithful to the word and the call of Christ to be the ones that live with a very big bushel basket of mercy and hope and grace for the world around us. Amen? Amen. Father God, we thank you for your word and your truth. We thank you for these principles that you give to us. And I pray, Lord, that we would be found faithful in living these things out day by day, that you would be honored in them and that you would be glorified through the actions of your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We close our time together with a hymn of, inv of invitation. And I invite you to know Jesus as your Savior. I invite you to follow him as your Lord. I invite you to surrender it all at the foot of the cross. Find forgiveness and peace and healing and strength in him. And if you have a burden of prayer of any sort, I am honored and happy to pray with you and, and be a blessing in your life. Let's stand together and Elizabeth will lead us in a song. My prayer that this sermon has been a blessing to you and that the Lord spoke to you through these words. We appreciate your participation. If we can be of ministry to you or your family, feel free to give us a call at the church office, 304-725-5917. We look forward to hearing from you. Until then, God bless you.